ocean is more ancient than the mountains and freighted with the memories and the dreams of time. What was once a prosperous oceanic nomadic city in Iberia during its golden age, Valviento became one of the many victims of the profound silence which saw its inhabitants completely decimated. After a failed attempt to restore order to the destroyed city, the Iberian Inquisition soon abandoned the ruins, leaving the few survivors to their fate. After decades, the Inquisition and Iberia itself had long since assumed the city was now a ghost town, a beached husk belonging to a once proud nation. Little did they know, the people of that city survived with the help of a dark and sinister ritual that would only be uncovered decades later in the Undertides event. So, let's take a look at this ravaged city, its inhabitants, and the themes and references that follow it. Salviento is described as an oceanic nomadic city along the coast of Iberia. Such cities are relatively unique to Iberia, which makes sense given most nations are more inland and thus don't need um, seafaring cities. Given its nature as an oceanic nomadic city, I assume it was designed to align itself along the coast of Iberia and would then break off and sail the ocean in the event of a catastrophe until it makes landfall somewhere else along the coast. This process would presumably be slower than that of land-faring nomadic cities, that is unless Iberia used any potential Aegir technology for propulsion. However, nothing is mentioned so I can only speculate. Regardless, the idea that Iberia had these vast city ships at one point is impressive to say the least. Unfortunately, the profound silence destroyed half the city rendering it beached on the Iberian coastline and completely unseaworthy. The design of this city also alludes to the fate and the fate of its survivors. The outer structure of the city, which arc over the streets below, resemble that of a ribcage, much like the old corpses of beached whales. The more substance decays away, the less there is to survive on. By the time the events of Undertides take place, Salviento is nothing more than a completely rotted skeleton with no carry-on left for the inhabitants to survive on alone. But before I talk about the references and themes surrounding Salviento, I should probably give a brief synopsis of the event's story. If you've already read the story, or you wish to avoid spoilers then feel free to skip this part. Though be warned, spoilers will be littered throughout the video regardless, so if you haven't already played the story, I highly recommend doing that first. So the story itself starts at Rhode Island. After completing a previous mission and filing a laughable attempt at an after-action report, Mood, Gaddy hears a familiar song and tracks it down to Spectre's hospital bed, only for her to have vanished. After some searching, Skadi confronts Gladia, who had taken her former subordinate. After Skadia, after Skadia, after Skadi tries to reason with Gladia, the Abyssal Hunter captain says just two words in Iberian: Salviento. Skadi recognizes the word as the name of an old Iberian city and takes some undeclared vacation time to search for her friends. Skadi makes her way out to the barren lands to find an old acquaintance, Jose. After some talking, he gives her a map to Salviento, as all good NPCs should. He also makes her change into a more aesthetically attractive outfit that supposedly will help blend in while travelling Iberia. Mm, however, given that the outfit doesn't seem to fit in at all anywhere, and the Inquisition instantly had their eyes on her, I kind of feel like Ol Jose over here was doing this more for our benefit than her own. But she accepts and travels to Salviento as a wandering singer armed with a harp and a large case that is totally holding a saxophone. 100%. Please believe me. Anyway, Scaddy eventually makes her way to Salviento, the long death husk of a city. No doubt devoid of life, right? Right? Well, Scaddy meets a few inhabitants who completely ignore her. In fact, they almost seem unaware of her, 
simply counting a number on repeat. After some pickpocketing shenanigans leading to a good old fashioned Spanish bar fight, Gaddy meets Anita, who quickly becomes our guide throughout the event, providing exposition as we progress. She also takes us to another more lucid inhabitant by the name of Grandma Petra. Unfortunately, Grandma Petra seems to be suffering some illness, possibly some form of dementia given that she talks as though unable to grasp her current reality. She provides some exposition through crazed rantings, leading us to realise that she was around during the profound silence and possibly the only living survivor of the event in Salviento who actually experienced it in person. Afterwards, we're invited for some food. The decaying mush of long, out-of-date seafood. Honestly, the fact these people are even alive and not dead from food poisoning is a Lovecraft horror in of itself. However, fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately for everyone involved, that night happens to be the 100th Tide and our first look into the dark ritual plaguing Salviento and possibly other coastal settlements along the abandoned Iberian coastline. See, what happens is, every 100 high tides, the people of Salviento draw lots from a pot in the form of seashells. All but one of the seashells are white, the other is red. Those who take the red shell must head over to the sea that night, and in the morning, an abundance of food from the sea is washed ashore. Now, with Terra having two moons, I can't really speculate on how the tides work. There isn't really enough information on the size and distance of those two moons to really come up with an estimation. However, on Earth, there are two high tides every 24 hours and 50 minutes, every lunar cycle. This means that 100 high tides is roughly 50 days of waiting, at least if it were on Earth. But suddenly, the Iberian Inquisition arrived. No one could have possibly expected that. The Inquisitor, Irene, tries to reason with the locals and figure out what's going on, but after realising the futility of her methods, she topples the pot and goes searching for her true target, Gaddy. The two confront each other, and after schooling Irene for a bit, uh, Skadi comes across the High Inquisitor, Dario, who reminds everyone that only he gets to school Irene. What they didn't know was Skadi's injuries, specifically her blood, will attract the sea terrors like sharks. After some fighting, Irene eventually backs off, but then comes the morning. Piles and piles of seafood are strewn across the coast of Salviento, a reward for their sacrifice the night before. It is now that Skadi sees the bishop and Gladia. The bishop is seemingly the mastermind of all this, belonging to a cult known as the Church of the Deep. They twisted the scriptures of the Lateran religion to indoctrinate the inhabitants of the ruined city into this sacrifice, not just the sacrifice of the chosen inhabitant at the night before, but the eventual change all the inhabitants will receive because the food they are eating has seaborne DNA in it, so the inhabitants are slowly turning into seaborne themselves. Gaddy confronts Gladia, who subdues her rather effortlessly. She hints to Skadi that she is actually against the bishop, for letting her go. In order for Skadi to know the truth, she will have to finally enter the chapel, which is now possible with the bishop in town. Skadi descends the depths until she finds herself in a cave below the ocean. At long last she finds her, Spectre, Laurentina, suspended in a column of water. It is revealed that Spectre had been infected by the Church of the Deep as an experiment. Once the bishop fulfills his role of villain monologue, Gladia launches a surprise attack, which comes as a surprise to absolutely no one, and she gets torn a new one by the seaborne creature. The seaborne is introduced to us as the first to talk, as it is, well, the first talk. However, it reveals in a shocking twist that Skadi and the other Abyssal Hunters are actually part seaborn. In fact, it is the very reason her blood attracts the other sea terrors and explains why she often dreams of the ocean depth. Skadi nearly succumbs to the seaborn's influence, but Gladia gets up and attacks. Eventually, they kill the first to talk and free Spectre. Gaddy finally opens the case to reveal her sword and Spectre's pizza cutter. Now that it's three hunters versus one bishop. Unfortunately for the bishop, he can only move diagonally, which seriously limits his chance of escape. 
So instead, he turns into what I can only describe as a cross between Lovecraftian horror and Audrey 2. After some chasing and fighting, the three hunters together end the monster bishop. Oh yeah, by the way, the Inquisition was going to blow up the city, prompting Irene to try and evacuate the inhabitants, but then Calcet made an appearance, presumably because the event would have been far too short without her dialogue. After the Abyssal Hunters defeat the bishop, Calcet later sends a monster to destroy the chapel, stealing it and its secrets away forever. She also later reveals that she and Gladia had planned the whole thing, which arguably explains how Gladia could infiltrate Rhode Island so easily. On the bright side, this probably means that Skadi won't get punished for her unauthorised absence. Of course, the Inquisition can't just let this go, so Calcet offers herself as a prisoner, but we'll sail that ship later. Though it is also revealed that Gladia is on her way to turning into a seaborn herself. But for now, the event ends, and the inhabitants of Salviento are saved. Probably. Maybe. At least I hope so. Now, with that out of the way, let's start talking about the various themes of the story. The theme of decay is prevalent throughout the entire time Scaddy is in Salviento. I've already mentioned how the city itself is designed to look like a decaying corpse of a whale, but the theme of rot and decay is shown everywhere. The food the inhabitants eat before the ritual is rotting, the streets themselves are crumbling, buildings slowly falling apart, most of them don't even have doors or windows left, no doubt due to decades of seawater breeze rotting the wood. The people themselves are also wasting away, starved of food, their bodies are more leaf, their minds are also decaying. The inhabitants have a much more limited understanding of the world compared to an ordinary human. Even Grandma Petra, who lived before the profound silence, had been slowly losing her mind over the years due to illness. Then, there's the fishification of the inhabitants, slowly pushing their consciousness to a more hive-mind-like existence. Even their individuality is mostly rotting away. Even with people living in the city, there is no life in Salviento. It is a dying city. If the Church of the Deep had succeeded, the current generation living there would probably have been the last. In many ways, the decay of Salviento is a mirror of the very decay all of Iberia is facing. The nation never recovered from the events of the Profound Silence. The fact that these sea-worshipping cults are able to influence the settlements across the coast completely under the Inquisition's noses just shows how much of Iberia has rotted away. And if nothing happens to change this, soon enough all of Iberia will be in that same late stage of collapse. The Profound Silence was not a bang that ended the nation, but rather the trigger event a long whimper of a nation that very well knows it is doomed, and none knew it as well as the inhabitants of Salviendo. Existentialism is another predominant theme throughout the story. With the present theme of decay and slow death comes the question of the afterlife. The Church of the Deep uses this ex existentialism as to their advantage in tricking the locals of Salviento and other coastal settlements. Those who follow the cult believe that their life is, as a human is only temporary, that the true goal of life is to return to the sea, to become a seaborn. In a twisted way, this is seen as a form of ascension beyond the life that they know, and to many of the inhabitants it provides a sense of comfort to the constant existential dread that forms their otherwise seemingly meaningless existence. Without the Church of the Deep, the locals would die with nothing and become nothing, but with the cult, they feel like there is salvation towards the end. Whether or not it will be possible to rehabilitate the locals after decades of indoctrination is sketchy at best. But then, of course, there's the fish people. Of course, the Lovecraft inspiration is obvious. Its themes exist everywhere, from the people, to the ocean, to the incomprehensible horrors of creatures whose appearance make little sense. But one interesting factor is just how much influence a single Lovecraft story has over this story. The Shadow over Innsmouth. From the beginning, the driving goal of the characters revolve around a similar idea, family. 
In Shadow Over Innsmouth, the protagonist is trying to learn more about his family tree. Passing through Innsmouth as a means, in Undertides the goal is more direct. Gaddy needs to save Spectre and in doing so she must travel to Salviento. Of course, in this case they aren't a literal family, but as a group of hunters who spend their lives together, they are sisters in a figurative sense, but perhaps also in a literal sense due to their seaborne blood as Gaddy discovers later. Maybe they perhaps are related in that kind of way. Both Skadi and the narrator meet someone who tells them about Salviento and Innsmouth, as well as warn them of the strange happenings in the area. When the narrator reaches Innsmouth, he is instantly out of place compared to the unfriendly inhabitants who either ignore him or look at him as though he is the strange one, much like Skadi's entrance into Salviento. In Undertides, Anita plays a similar role to the grocery store clerk in the book. A teenage boy who gives the narrator some reprieve for being one of the few more normal people in the town. Both characters help the protagonist and provide ex exposition to the town. However, in Anita's case, she stays with Skadi throughout the plot of the event, in many ways providing more help than the narrator of Innsmouth was given. To an extent, Grandma Petra is also similar to the old man, Zadok Allen, both from a time before things started to go downhill before suffering from their own madness, though in Zadok's case it's less illness and more alcoholism. Although fortunately for us, Petra doesn't provide pages of exposition in one single conversation. In fact, while Petra has a lot of similarities to Zadok, because Anita stays with Skadi, she mainly takes on the responsibility of providing the kind of exposition Zadok provides in the book. In many ways, Anita plays the role of both the clerk and Zadok when it comes to providing lore and explanations to Skadi. Then there's the ritual itself and the cultist element. In Shadow Over Innsmouth, a captain, Obed March, made a deal with the deity of the sea, Dagon. He would receive gifts of gold and fish, but in exchange, someone must be sacrificed regularly. Eventually, the people of Innsmouth caught wind and, and arrest Marsh, but in doing so, invoked the wrath of the sea monsters who killed half the town, which would later be covered up as an epidemic. After, Marsh was released and led the town as the leader of the cult, worshipping the sea creatures, promoting the regular sacrifice for boons, but also the marriage between the human inhabitants and the sea monsters to create hybrids. These fish people will start off looking human at a young age, but will turn into fish people as they get older until they are eventually drawn out to sea. In many ways, this is almost exactly like the events of Salviento after the Profound Silence. In this case, I'd argue that the Profound Silence itself wiping out half the city is reminiscent of the attack on Innsmouth, either a deliberate reference or just very similar. In both cases, the towns never recover and slowly fall into decay. In Salviento's case, they stick with the secretive nature which Obed Marsh first uses in for his grand scheme, while also keeping heavy references to the second phase of his cult. The inhabitants of Salviento have little clue what is actually happening, yet they still worship the sea and the cult, as it is what provides them with food frequently enough to survive. Much like with Innsmouth, a single local is sacrificed to the ocean during each ritual. To the people of Salviento, they believe that it to be an ascension to live in the ocean. In reality, there is no doubt they're probably just fed to the monsters, or worse. The slow conversion into Seaborn is also apparent, although in Ark Knights it is done through a slow process of consuming Seaborn DNA, which slowly changes the people's own bodies, as opposed to the more indirect method of monster fucking a generation of fish people. There's no grinding Nemo for the Iberia, thank you very much. The Inquisition and the Hunters in a way act as the police and marines that raid Innsmouth once they find out what is happening, finally put an end to the cult. Although instead of torpedoing a reef, they blow up a chapel. And last, but by no means least, there's Skadi herself. She is very much the same role as the Innsmouth narrator. We've already discussed the begin and drive of family leading them to their fishy towns, but they both serve as the investigative side of the story, slowly uncovering the horror of Innsmouth and Salviento respectively. They both have much that they don't know when it comes to themselves and their origins, but more importantly, both are related to the sea monsters, 
In Shadow Over Innsmouth, the narrator finds out that he is a descendant of one of Obed Marsh's daughters, and is thus a fish person himself. He later has dreams of the ocean and the fish people, and finally ends the story by going to the ocean and joining them. Scaddy dreams about the ocean and about the Seaborn. She later finds out from the first to talk that she herself is related to the Seaborn and can turn into one too. In many ways, the first talk is similar to the narrator's dream of his fish mo monster grandmother telling him to join them. Fortunately for Skadi, she had Gladia to step in and stop it from happening, but without her, easy to imagine Skadi changing, much like the narrator in Intimuth. But with that, both stories come to an end, and so do the literary parallels. In a way, Undertides is a fascinating and unique retelling of Shadow Over Innsmouth, told through the lens of Arknight's terror, with the Spanish-themed nation of Iberia as the backdrop. Taking one of our favourite operators and dropping her into the realm of existential horror like a Call of Cthulhu campaign. The event perfectly translates the classic Lovecraft tropes and themes of Shadow Over Innsmouth and frames it within their own unique world and in their own unique way. Hypergriff perfectly encapsulates the dire sense of slow decay experienced by the remains of Salviento, and the hopelessness of its people. They provide an air of mystery and horror at every turn, making use of dark and gloomy artwork and unsettling music reminiscent of something scurrying about, lurking in the darkness, a horror studying you as intently as you are studying it. The story's ending also serves as a great lead to the second event in Iberia's story arc, Doltifera Navis. All in all, Salviento is a fascinating look at the horror of a land slowly dying out in a whimper, and Undertides is a great event, and an amazing story which I highly recommend new Arknights players pick up. But that is all for now. In the future I plan to make more videos covering Iberia, the Golden Age, and the Profound Silence, so if you enjoyed please consider dropping a like and subscribe. It's free and it helps the channel grow. But for now, thank you for getting this far in the video, and I shall see you all later. Bye bye.